Uh, if you are a visitor with us tonight, we want you to know how much we appreciate your presence and what we have been doing now for quite some time or a question and answer series on Sunday night. And what I've been doing is taking questions from the congregation and trying to answer those as best I can according to what Scripture teaches. I want to do, I guess what you might say is a little disclaimer on tonight's question. And the reason I say that is I do not know the reason that the question was submitted. Uh, you'll see why here in just a moment. If the question was submitted because of genuine, genuine concern for somebody else, then I understand it. If it was submitted because somebody is just wanting me to set somebody else straight, I'm not here to do that, okay? And here is the question. It has to do with smoking. Smoking is not addressed in the Bible. There are a lot of Christians who smoke and use tobacco products. Will this cause people to be lost? Okay. Now, let me say this before I begin also. I have a father that smoked for over 50 years before he finally gave it up. And so I have grown up around smokers. As a matter of fact, probably I made my dad madder than anything else one time when we got in the car to go to my grandmother's. And in that day and time before garage door openers, my brother and I were the garage door openers and closers. And dad backed the car out of the garage. Mom was already in the car. My brother was in the car. I put the garage door down, crawled into my place in the back seat behind him, and he had already lit up a cigarette. I cracked the window because I could not breathe. I do not like to be around smoke. I grew up around it. And I cracked the window so I'd get a little fresh air going down the road. And my dad said, son, either roll up the window or get out of the car. We had gone about a quarter of a mile down the road, and I said, Dad, would you please pull over? Now, you have to realize my grandmother lived over in Van Leer, and we were in Dixon. I got out of the car. Dad pulled away. And I started walking toward Van Leer. I was 14 years old. I didn't know any better. And a few minutes later, I'd made it maybe 200 yards down the road. Here comes Dad back. And he said, get back in the car, and I did. He had thrown the cigarette out, and we drove the rest of the way to Van Leer with no cigarette. I don't know. My mom, I'm sure, said something to him. But that started something with us. And, and over the years, my dad reached a point where he had smoked inside the house. He reached a point where he wouldn't do that anymore um, out of respect for us. He'd go outside. He'd eat and then go outside, always go outside and smoke his cigarette. And then there was a time where I was a young married man and I had always wanted my dad to give it up. And we were talking about it one day, it just came up and he said, son, it's not as easy as you think. And uh, I'm proud to say that three years ago, this summer, actually it would be July 1st, or right around that time, dad laid them down and has not picked them up since. I didn't even realize it until we were out at the house three years ago and Mom made the comment to Becky, my wife, and said, don't say anything, but Jeff's dad has not picked up a cigarette in over two weeks, and he has been able to stay away from them. I'm thankful for that. Now, all of that being said, you know my background. You know why this is kind of a passion for me, because, and as a preacher, I'll share some things with you I have also encountered with others. But let me just share some things with you, and I want to talk to you tonight. Um... There are some things that Scripture does not say, and the person that turned this in is right. You will not go anywhere in Scripture and find a passage that says, Thou shalt not smoke, and all who smoke are going to hell. It's not there. You can read it from cover to cover, and you will not find it. There are passages, however, like this, that tell us that the unrighteous will not enter the kingdom of God, and as you find here in 1 Corinthians 6, he begins to list them. And he tells us, uh, fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, effeminate, homosexuals, thieves, covetous, drunkards, revilers, swindlers. He says these people will not inherit the kingdom of God. Uh, these people are people that God says, if you're a Christian and you go back into this, because he tells them in the very next verse after this, such were some of you. You were this. But then he tells them, you've been washed, you've been justified. Um, and, and he is, his plea to them, if you read the entire chapter, is that they do not go back into the sins that they've, they've left. 
Another passage that we can turn to is one that we find, and, and I'm giving you the first part of this. You recognize Galatians 5, beginning in verse 19. We'll catch the end of it here in just a moment, all the way through verse 21. And what Paul calls these, as he writes his letter to the churches of the Galatian region, are the, what he calls works of the flesh. Deeds of the flesh, as the New American Standard translates it. He says they're evident. What are they? Immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy. You know, we may ask a question, well, will a person go to hell for smoking? But what about jealousy? Hmm? What about jealousy? What about uh, outburst of anger? What about getting into disputes constantly or dissensions or factions or envying? He names all these, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these. And then he says this, of which I forewarn you just as I have forewarned you that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. He says, if you struggle with jealousy and you don't learn to overcome it, you don't deal with it, you don't ask God to help you through it, he says, you won't be in the kingdom of heaven. If you're a person that is given to outburst of anger, you lose your temper all the time and you don't ask God, help me deal with this, help me to overcome it, Paul is saying, you won't be in the kingdom of heaven. So, you know, we, if we try to single out one thing and say that's bigger than all the others, I think we're missing, I know we're missing what God is saying to us. There are a host of things because God is looking for certain people, people who want to honor him, people who are striving to do what's right. Uh, this one is found in Revelation 21, verse 8. He says, But the cowardly and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and immoral persons and sorcerers and all idolaters and all liars, their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. But I want you to notice, too, unbelieving. Well, first of all, cowardly. If a person is afraid to speak out about their Christian faith, if they're afraid to live that life in front of people that they encounter every day, he says, You're not going to be in heaven, folks. He says, if you are a person that, is, that lies, you're just an outright liar. What he tells us is that's as bad as a murderer. Because the penalty is the same. It's as bad as being an immoral person. It's as bad as practicing uh, the, 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 the magical arts, if you will. These things are things that will keep us out of God's kingdom, out of our eternal home. Um, another one, Revelation 21, verse 27, he says, Nothing unclean and no one who practices abomination, and he brings out lying again, shall ever come into it, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. In, in verse 15 of chapter 22 of Revelation, outside, that is outside of the city that God has built, are the dogs and the sorcerers and the immoral persons and the murderers and idolaters and everyone who loves and practices lying. Folks, I would give more attention to that than I think anything because he has mentioned that three times already. And then this passage in, in Romans 16 uh, we've heard verse 17, I urge you, brethren, to keep your eye on those, mark those, uh, the King James says, who cause dissensions and hindrances contrary to what you've learned and turn away from them. But don't you notice verse 18? He says, for such men are slaves, not of our Lord Jesus Christ, but of their own appetites. And by their smooth and flattering speech, they deceive the hearts of the unsuspecting. He says, they're slaves of their own appetites. Well, if you combine that one with what we find in Philippians chapter 3, there in verse 18, he, tell, he says, For many walk, just as I have told you, and now tell you even weeping. See, Paul is, this is a struggle for Paul. Why? Because he says they're enemies of the cross of Christ. But don't you notice what I've underlined? Whose God is their appetite, and whose glory is in their shame who set their minds on earthly things. There are two things he brings out. Their God is their appetite. They, they're, they're gluttons. They have trouble controlling their eating. They live to eat. And he says, not only that, the people who glory in things that are shameful. 
Folks, we have a society in which people tend to glory today in things that are shameful. And he says these are things, you know, that he says their end is destruction. So what I'm trying to say is there are a lot of things out there that we, we need to look at the whole spectrum and not try to single out one thing. Now, if we're asking it because we care about somebody, there are some other things. There are some things that Scripture does say. And one of those is this. Romans 12, verse 1. Paul says, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice. Your body, your physical body, present it as a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship, or King James says your reasonable worship. Our physical body is to be presented to God as a living sacrifice. Every day as we live in this world, we are to take care of these physical bodies that God has given us because he's only given us one in this life. And we are to take care of that. And we are to use it to honor him, not to do things to it that are harmful and destructive and do not honor the one who gave it to us in the first place. Um, And then... 1 Corinthians 6, verses 19 and 20. I I shared with you earlier, verses 9 and 10, where he talks about who will not inherit the kingdom of God. But here in 19 and 20, he says, Do you not know? And Paul loves to use that phrase, by the way. If you start through the book of 1 Corinthians, and I know uh, Vance has been teaching you this. uh, Y'all have been going through it on Sunday morning. But Paul uses this phrase over and over again. Do you not know? He uses it in Romans, uses it in 1 Corinthians. Do you not know? It's like, you're supposed to know this. He says, Do you not know? That your body is the temple, a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you. Your physical body is a temple in which God's Holy Spirit dwells. And he says, whom you have from God, that is the Holy Spirit. And then he says, and you're not your own. And what does he say? You have been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. That physical body, he says, use it to glorify God in all that you do. And then this passage in verse 12 of 1 Corinthians chapter 6, he says, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are profitable. You know, it may be lawful. He says, it's not profitable. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be mastered by anything. You know, the question I have when it comes to anything is, does it master you? Do you control it or does it control you? I went years ago, Becky and I did, to visit a lady. You don't know her. Uh, I knew her and her husband. They attended where I preached. Uh, She smoked. And I visited her in Baptist Hospital, the old Baptist Hospital. I learned something that night. She said, Jeff, last night I ran out of cigarettes. I said, you did? She said, yeah. She said, I took my hospital gown off, put my clothes on, snuck out of the hospital, went down, got in my car, drove to the convenience market, got me some more, and snuck back into the hospital. Now, this was back before the hospital said, you know, put the smoking ban on it. She had to have her cigarettes. She snuck out of the hospital. I don't know that the nurses ever knew. If they knew, they never seemed to say anything and went and got those cigarettes so she could continue what she was addicted to. That's the only word I know to use. It was an addiction, and she had to have them. I had a nurse friend one time that had a patient that had emphysema and was on oxygen. She said, this patient would beg me to disconnect, to unhook the oxygen so she could smoke a cigarette, and when she had finished, she'd let me hook it back up. Folks, that's when something controls you. You don't control it any longer. And that's when it's not good. That's when our body has become, we have become slaves in our bodies to something else. And another passage here, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 23, pretty much says the same thing. Paul says there, all things are profitable or lawful, but not all things are profitable. All things are lawful. But all things do not edify. It doesn't build me up. It doesn't make me what I need to be. 
So what do I know? I know that there are no health benefits, to my knowledge, that are associated with smoking. Matter of fact, I pulled this up just today from the CDC. Um, I'm just going to share with you some things that they have. If you want to, you can pull it up yourself. Go look it up. The, the health effects of cigarette smoking. It says cigarette smoking harms nearly every organ of the body, causes many diseases, and reduces the health of smokers in general. It said that cigarette smoking is the leading preventable cause of death in the United States. And it said that cigarette smoking causes more than 480,000 deaths every year in the United States. Every year. Um, as a matter of fact, one of the things I found that I thought was interesting, and it just goes through. Ten times as many U.S. citizens have died prematurely from cigarette smoking than have died in all the wars fought in the U.S. during its history. Smokers are more likely than non-smokers to develop heart disease, stroke, and lung cancer. Smokers are at greater risk for diseases that affect heart and blood vessels. Smoking can cause lung disease by damaging airways and small air sacs found in your lungs. Smokers are 12 to 13 times more likely to die from COPD than non-smokers. Uh, smoking can cause cancer almost anywhere in your body. And notice this, if nobody smoked, this is what they put in, if nobody smoked, one of every three cancer deaths in the United States would not happen. What I know, there are no benefits to my knowledge that are associated with smoking. And I also know that many people started when they were young, usually in their teenage years. My dad, I think, started either as a teenager or in his 20s. And I haven't run into one person that has said, you know, I like it, I love it, I'm glad I started. Most of the ones I run into and talk to say, it's a bad habit and I wish I'd never picked it up. I wish I'd never started. Not to mention how much it costs today. You know, if you could take the money, I can remember, and this is something that goes way back. When I was a teenager in a class at Walnut Street in a young men's training class, there was a man that came in that said, if you would take, if a person smoked a pack a day and would take the money that it cost for a pack of cigarettes, and this was back in the 70s, and put it in a bank account earning simple interest, they said in 20 years you'd have enough money to buy your own bank. I will, that that kind of got my attention. That kind of got my attention. But the last thing I know is this, and that is that Jesus is the final judge of the living and the dead. I do not stand in his place, and I'm glad I do not. All I can say to anyone that is smoking is I hope that you'll quit. I care too much about you. I've seen what it's done. I lost an aunt to it. I'm glad my dad did quit. And I, I know a woman that died from secondhand smoke. Her husband smoked all of her life. She never touched a cigarette day one. But she lived in it. And she died from it. It's just not worth it. I can't, I can't find anything anywhere in my being that says it's worth it to do it. And you know, if, if I can say anything to all of us, it's this. If you know somebody that does smoke, pray for them. Because they may be wanting to quit, trying to quit. And they don't need you to berate them. They don't need you to get on them. They don't need you. You're going to hell because you smoke. Do you know that? What they do need is for you to say, you know, I care. I want to help if I can. I had a, a, an elder one time that was put up for elder and he turned it down. He told me later why, because he was later put up and he accepted it. He said, Jeff, the first time, he said, I was a smoker. And he said, I didn't feel that I could lead a congregation effectively if I had that in my life because I could not help others when I was struggling with that in my own life. He said, I finally decided I was gonna quit. I bought a pack one day, I came home, I laid it on my dresser, and I never picked it up. 
But I did a lot of praying during that time. And I asked God to help me let it go. And to my knowledge, he never did pick them up again. So, if you are here tonight and you are a smoker, I don't want this to come across to you as if I am being judgmental of you. I'm not. I have no right to. I, I hope that you will quit. I care too much about you. And I don't want to come to your hospital. I don't want to come to the hospital and see you because you're there for that reason. And I really don't want to do your funeral because you've died from that. No, I'd rather know that you've been able to quit. My dad had that smoker's cough. Three years before he quit, he had that smoker's cough. And I hated to hear that. Because I thought I was going to lose him to that. I'm just thankful he's given it up. That answers that question. And that's as far as I'm going tonight. But I want to say this more than anything to all of you. You know, I think all of us, and I've said this before, all of us are trying to get to heaven. And there's not a single perfect one of us in this bunch. I didn't include this passage, I, and, and I had it marked. I didn't put it up there. I didn't even think to put it on the slide. But, you know, when you start talking about things that God also condemns, he also speaks to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 13, about gossiping. You know, that's another sin. And God judges that too. But we don't ask so much about things like that. Or busybodies, people that are in everybody else's business, God judges that. You know, the thing is, we just need to ask ourselves, are we striving to do everything we can to get to where God wants us to be? Are we trying to put behind us those things that keep us away from Him? Are we guarding our lives? Are we seeking out His will? Do we love Him? And do we want to honor Him with our lives? And that's what we need to encourage each other to do. You know, we can talk, folks, about weather and sports and, you know, our jobs. But we really struggle talking to each other about our souls and about our spiritual well-being and about the needs that we may have for prayer or encouragement. We don't do too well at that. We're very protective of our lives. And that that's what we're supposed to be doing. We're supposed to be concerned about one another, considering how to stimulate one another to love and good works. Tonight, I want you to know that what I say to you is out of concern for your soul. That's the thing I'm more concerned about every one of you for than anything else is your soul. Because I don't care where you go in life or what you accomplish in this world, if you lose your soul, you've lost everything, folks. You've lost everything that counts, everything that has any value at all in this world. And I don't want to see you lose your soul. So please, if your soul is not in the safekeeping of our Lord, if you're not His child tonight, if you've not confessed Him, that is Jesus, turn from your sin and be buried with Him in baptism, why not tonight? And maybe you're a person here tonight and you need our prayers. We want to pray for you. We care for you. And we want you to know that. If you need to respond to our Lord's invitation, won't you come as together we stand and sing.